Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Delta Airlines December quarter and full year 2020 financial results conference call. My name is Kathy, and I will be your coordinator. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode until we conduct a question and answer session following the presentation. As a reminder, today's call is being recorded, and I now would like to turn the conference over to Jill Greer, Vice President of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thanks, Kathy. Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for our December quarter and full year 2020 earnings call. Joining us from Atlanta today are our CEO, Ed Bastian, our President, Glenn Howenstein, and our interim co-CFO, Gary Chase. Our entire leadership team is available for the Q&A session. Ed will open the call with an overview of Delta's performance and strategy. Glenn will provide an update on the revenue environment, and Gary will discuss cost and liquidity in our balance sheet. We've extended our call today to 90 minutes total to make sure we have plenty of time for questions. For analysts, we ask you to please limit yourself to one question and a brief follow-up so we can get to, you, to as many of you as possible. After the analyst Q&A, we'll move to our media questions, after which Ed will provide some closing remarks. Today's discussion contains forward-looking statements that represent our beliefs or expectations about future events. All forward-looking statements involve risks and uncertainties that could cause the actual results to differ materially from the forward-looking statements. Some of the factors that may cause such differences are described in Delta's SEC filings. We'll also discuss non-GAAP financial measures, and all results exclude special items unless otherwise noted. You can find a reconciliation of our non-GAAP measures on the Investor Relations page at ir.delta.com. And with that, I'll turn the call to Ed. Well, thanks, Jill. Good morning, everyone. This morning, we reported pre-tax losses of $2.1 billion for the December quarter and $9 billion for the full year, capping the toughest year in Delta's history. We've been saying all along that this recovery wouldn't follow a straight line, that demand choppiness as COVID infections rose across the country, and government and public health officials issued travel advisories. Our revenues of $3.5 billion for the fourth quarter were just 30% of last year's levels. And although we still have a tough winter ahead of us, we're encouraged by the progress that's been made on the vaccine front and are confident that Delta is positioned to successfully lead our industry into recovery as the year unfolds. While 2020 was a challenging year, we delivered results for all of our stakeholders. For our employees, we prioritized protecting their health and safety and preserving our culture. For example, throughout the past year, we have offered and continue to offer an extensive employee testing program and pay protection programs for employees diagnosed, exposed, or at high risk of COVID-19. We have had remarkable volunteerism, up to 40,000 employees taking unpaid leaves throughout the summer to protect jobs and preserve cash. And in fact, we still have over 10,000 employees in the month of January out on unpaid leaves. And we have made it through this year without furloughing any employees. Our emphasis on taking care of our people is reflected in Delta's recognition this week by Glassdoor as one of the best places to work for the fifth year in a row coming in seventh overall on a list of 100 large companies, the highest rank Delta has ever received, all in the face of a pandemic. Really incredible work by our team. For our customers, we're keeping them at the center of our recovery. Our health and safety efforts, from being the only major U.S. airline that continues to block middle seats, to partnering with leading names like the Mayo Clinic, Emory Healthcare, Lysol, and Purell in developing the Delta Care Standard to launching the industry's first COVID-tested transatlantic flights with no quarantine on arrival are all targeted at restoring consumer confidence in travel and reopening borders, which will be an important driver of revenue growth in the future. Our customers recognize the outstanding service our people provide with an all-time high December net promoter score of 71, up 20 points year over year, and by business travel news naming Delta the top airline for corporate travelers for the 10th year in a row, and once again coming in first place on all 12 metrics that they measure in the survey. That customer preference and loyalty is what underlies our revenue premium and has never been stronger. And finally, for our shareholders, we secured our liquidity position and rescaled our cost structure. We reduced liquidity risk by raising over $25 billion in capital since the pandemic began. With approximately $17 billion of liquidity, our adjusted net debt, however, only increased $8 billion year over year 
and we don't expect that net debt will increase going forward. We've sw swiftly removed costs from the business with three consecutive quarters of operating expenses declining by nearly 50% or more, increasing the variable nature of our cost structure. In fact, in the December quarter, our all-in unit costs were down 4.5% year over year, despite loan capacity being down 44%. That is a remarkable achievement and credits of all Delta employees for making that happen. And by keeping our costs under control, we leveraged the modest increase in net sales to reduce our average daily cash burn to $12 million a day for the December quarter, half of what it was in the September quarter, and a decrease of 90% since the early days of the pandemic in late March. Turning to 2021, we expect the March quarter to look similar to the December quarter, with the March quarter revenues at 35 to 40 percent of March quarter 2019 levels, and our cash burn for the quarter holding at 10 to 15 million dollars per day. We expect that will be followed by an inflection point this spring, as vaccine distribution continues, travel restrictions start to ease, and consumer confidence begins to grow hopefully resulting in cash burn reaching break-even or better by the second quarter. And as the year progresses, we expect demand will start to accelerate as vaccinations become more widespread and the virus is in a contained state, and customers gain greater confidence to make future travel commitments. This should enable a sustained recovery to begin in the second half of 2021 with a return to profitability this summer. So as we work through this environment, we're focused on five things. First, as always, we're committed to keeping our culture intact and our employees engaged. The Delta people are our most strategic asset. They have done a tremendous job this year and together will lead our airline through the recovery. Second, we'll continue to prioritize the customer with a focus on health and safety and the maintenance of, Delta, of the industry's strongest network, thereby increasing loyalty and preference for our brand. Customers have shown they're willing to pay more for the quality of our network, product, and our service. The gains we've achieved in customer satisfaction position us well to drive sustainable revenue growth in the future. Third, we'll maintain our focus on innovation, which will enable our employees to improve the customer experience and drive efficiency through the business. And innovative thinking will power our ability to tackle big challenges in front of us like our goal of achieving carbon neutrality in the next decade. Fourth, we'll drive a competitive cost structure. Given the changes we've made over the last year, our goal is to sustain our non-fuel unit costs at or below 2019 levels by the December quarter of this year on roughly 75% of 2019 capacity levels, displaying continued agility in managing our cost. And finally, we're committed to debt reduction and creating long-term shareholder value including continuing to protect our owners so that they can participate in future upside without dilution. Because for investors, while the near-term demand path is murky, industry fundamentals remain intact. Following almost a year of subdued travel, customers are beginning to exhibit behavior that is indicative of pent-up demand. Shopping visits across Delta's di digital channels are significantly outpacing the passenger volumes we're carrying in our most recent corporate survey, 40% of respondents expect full recovery by 2022. Our partners at American Express are also seeing encouraging signs, whether it's cardholders holding on to their points in anticipation of redeeming them for air travel, or a recent survey that suggested approximately 70% of respondents expect to take a trip in 2021 after not traveling in 2020. Although it will take time, Customers want to travel again when they feel it's safe. They feel they've had a year of their life taken from them, and they're starting to get ready to reclaim it. Until then, we're fortunate to have the support of the U.S. government, which recognizes the importance of the airline industry, and we thank Congress and the administration for passing the COVID relief bill last month. As a result of that bill, we anticipate receiving approximately $3 billion in, addition, in additional payroll support funds largely on terms similar to the initial CARES Act program. These funds have been critical in saving thousands of industry jobs during an unprecedented level of demand decline. And it's why the U.S. airline industry is in the best position to recover from the pandemic over any other international market. 
So while 2020 was a difficult year and challenges will continue in 2021, I'm encouraged at some of the data that we're seeing. And I'm proud of the foundation that we've built at Delta. This company is well positioned to emerge in a stronger competitive position from this crisis and will continue to lead our industry in the years ahead. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Glenn. Thanks, Ed, and good morning, everyone. As Ed mentioned, we started the December quarter seeing encouraging demand trends, but with rising COVID cases and travel advisories, we began to see some weakness around Thanksgiving and into December. Despite that softness, the peak periods continue to outperform non-peak periods, and we've seen sequential improvement in total revenues, which recovered from being down 80% in the September quarter to down 70% in the December quarter on sellable capacity that was down 62%. On January 3rd, we had a $50 million ticket revenue day and carried more than 250,000 customers. Both of these were the highest since the onset of the pandemic. And despite having meaningfully less inventory for sale given our middle seat block, we outperformed on passenger revenue generation in the first nine months of the year. This is a testament to customers' willingness to pay a premium for the Delta difference. Leisure markets and sun destinations are the best performers in our network. With our approach of targeting sellable capacity to match demand, we are biasing restoring capacity to leisure markets. As a result, roughly one-third of our domestic capacity is currently deployed into leisure destinations. Our coastal hubs, especially New York and Boston, are still some of the weakest areas in our network with demand in those hubs only 20 to 25 percent recovered. International demand remains weak and is limited to essential travel. That said, we continue to work towards opening additional COVID-tested lanes of travel with no quarantine on arrival, similar to our Atlanta and Rome, Atlanta to Rome and Atlanta to Amsterdam flights. This will be important in restoring confidence in long-haul international travel as vaccine rollouts continue. Our premium seat strategy is holding up well. Domestic premium revenues performed in line with main cabin in the quarter. A good outcome considering that we're continuing to operate largely, a largely leisure driven environment with a higher proportion of premium seats held back due to our middle seat blocks. As all of you are aware, corporate demand continues to be depressed and was only 10 to 15 percent restored for the quarter. Corporate revenue was about three points higher than the September quarter with small and medium accounts, which make up half of our corporate revenues, recovering five points faster than large corporates. While the passenger revenue environment remains challenging, we're encouraged that efforts to diversify our revenue streams have paid off. Our American Express remuneration in 2020 was nearly $3 billion, down only 30% on a year-over-year -year basis. In fact, American Express has shared that spending on our co-brand car portfolio has performed in line to slightly better than their overall car portfolio spend in 2020. In the December quarter, MRO revenue was down almost 30% relative to the same period last year, while cargo revenue was up 10% on a year over year basis. This marks the first quarter of cargo revenue growth since the December 2018 quarter. Our December quarter results reflect the challenges that the pandemic has brought not just to Delta, but to the entire airline industry. I am incredibly grateful for the efforts of the entire Delta team in managing through the challenging year that we faced. Now that we think about 2021, we see three distinct phases to the year. And for each phase, we have levers to help us react to the emerging demand environment. In the first phase, we expect demand choppiness to continue. The booking curve to remain more compressed and the results to be similar to the December quarter. In response, we'll focus on making sure that our sellable capacity largely aligns with the emergence, emerging demand environment. For example, our January and February domestic schedule seats will be down three to 6% versus the non-holiday period in November. That will result in our March quarter sellable capacity being approximately 55% lower relative to the same period in 2019 consistent with the expected 60 to 65 percent revenue decline. We'll also continue to leverage our non-ticket revenue streams like cargo, loyalty, and MRO 
that we believe should continue to outperform passenger revenues. In the second phase, vaccination distribution continues, travel restrictions and advisories begin to ease, and customer confidence begins to grow. As that happens, we expect to see an extension of the booking curve, resulting in a cash-led recovery with revenue recovery to follow. We anticipate this will happen in the spring and will result in us achieving our cash burn break-even target. In response to the second phase, our middle seats will be a very powerful tool for us, one we can use to add capacity in a very cost-efficient way, generating a meaningful margin tailwind. In the final phase, vaccinations become more widespread and offices begin to reopen. We expect that to occur in the second half of 21, and as a result, in a, and result in a sustained improvement in demand and yield, with progression in cash generation as the booking curve normalizes. With the recovery initially fueled by leisure demand, Delta success will be driven by our superior connecting economics through our core hubs domestically and our partner hubs internationally. With 34 new aircraft deliveries this year, we'll also leverage higher gauge and more efficient aircraft that produce lower seat costs, more premium seats, and a better customer experience. This will allow us to capitalize on our brand affinity and upsell opportunities, which are enabled by the elimination of change fees for U.S. customers and the redemption of e-credits. It will take longer for corporate demand to return, but we are encouraged by the results of our recent corporate survey. Our corporate accounts are telling us that they largely anticipate returning to their offices and travel in the June and September quarters. They are also telling us by the end of 21, half are expecting to return to 50% to 100% of pre-COVID domestic travel and up to 50% of pre-COVID international travel. To our corporate customers, our commitment to you remains unchanged. Delta is ready when you are. We will be ready to serve our corporate customers by leveraging the strongest domestic and international networks, rebuilding focused cities and point-to-point -point flying based on customer needs, and by capitalizing on our efforts to always put the customer experience at the center of what we do. We're optimistic for the future, having built the right foundation and focusing on what we can control. We are confident in our ability to successfully navigate the post-pandemic recovery. And with that, I'll turn the call over to Gary. Thanks, Glenn, and good morning, everyone. Let me touch on the fourth quarter in 2020, and then I'll turn to the outlook for costs in the balance sheet as we head into 21. Our December quarter pre-tax loss of $2.1 billion is about $500 million better than the September quarter, given the revenue improvement Glenn just discussed, combined with strong cost discipline. We reduced costs by approximately 50% from 2019 levels for the third consecutive quarter. More importantly, our costs were up just 6% from the third quarter on 30% capacity growth, and three quarters of that increase came from higher fuel. Total unit cost, including fuel, was down 4.5% compared to 2019 on 44% lower flowing capacity. Our average daily cash burn for the December quarter was $12 million, half of the third quarter's 24. We closed the year with $16.7 billion in liquidity, an adjusted net debt of $18.8 billion, up about $8 billion versus year-end 2019. Now, as we look into the year ahead, improving demand fundamentals will underpin a transition of our financial focus, from pro protecting our liquidity to positioning the company for a return to profitability and free cash flow. I'll explain our approach to costs on our balance sheet as we make this transition. Let's start with costs. We need to stay flexible and maintain our discipline in order to position the company for the return to profitability I'd mentioned, as we expect continued choppiness in demand in the early part of the year. We've already taken structural steps to resize our business. Our two largest cost drivers, fleet and headcount, are both 15 to 20 percent smaller than they were in 2019. Headcount re reductions were a difficult but necessary decision. It was hard to see 18,000 talented and dedicated co-workers leave, but it's a testament to the Delta culture that these reductions were achieved entirely through voluntary means. We accelerated our fleet transformation by retiring aircraft with relatively short remaining lives 
and simplified our fleet by eliminating two entire families while increasing our gauge. On a run rate basis, these changes will drive more than $400 million in annualized cost benefit. As we add capacity in 21, we will drive higher utilization of our system, and we have room to rebuild our network from current levels at low incremental costs, approximately 40 to 50 percent of our December quarter non-fuel chasm. Our goal is to produce and sustain non-fuel unit costs below 2019 levels by the fourth quarter. That cost focus will be a key driver of profitability later in the year when demand returns. Looking to the March quarter, we're preparing for stronger demand by reactivating aircraft and restoring our people to full hours, driving about $200 million in additional costs versus the December quarter. Our March quarter total operating expense will be 35 to 40 percent lower than March quarter 19, with a total unit cost including fuel down 5 to 10 percent on approximately 35 percent lower flown capacity. Let's move now to capital, the balance sheet, and liquidity. As we begin the year, conditions are similar to where we exited 2020. A modest uplift in net sales should offset the cost investments we're making in the quarter, and as a result, we expect average daily cash burn between 10 and 15 million, similar to the December quarter. With further improvements in net sales as customers gain confidence, we expect our cash burn to cease this spring. With that goal in sight, we're turning our focus to how we will balance reinvesting in the business while reducing our debt levels. Given our expectations for cash flow in 21 and proceeds from the PSP extension, we expect our current adjusted net debt levels to be the high watermark for that important metric. For the full year, we're expecting $2.5 billion in gross capex, a significant reduction from the $4 to $5 billion that we were spending pre-COVID. We have $1.3 billion of aircraft purchase commitments for 34 new deliveries this year, which we have the option to fully finance, and about a billion in non-aircraft capex. Including retirements, we expect our fleet count at the end of 2021 will be 15% smaller than at year end 19, with total fleet declining from about 1,350 to about 1,130. An equal priority is to work on our balance sheet by reducing our liquidity and paying down debt. We have approximately 1.8 billion of debt maturities in 21 and 2.1 billion in 22. Our debt has an average interest rate of 4.6%, which will drive approximately 350 million in quarterly interest expense. However, we will begin reducing those expenses by paying down debt this year. We do not have mandatory pension contributions until 2025 under airline relief, but we expect to make at least 500 million in voluntary contributions this year. In terms of a quarter end outlook with about 3 billion of PSP support expected from the government in the March, March quarter, we project ending the period with 18 to 19 billion in liquidity and adjusted net debt of approximately 18 billion. Let me close by saying this. The Delta difference has never been more important, and I'd like to thank the Delta team for delivering for each other and for our customers amid the industry's most challenging environment ever. Because of your dedication, we will emerge from the crisis stronger and more resilient than ever. With that, I'll turn the call back over to Jill to begin the Q&A. Thanks, Gary. Kathy, we're ready for questions from the analysts. If you could give the instructions on how to get in the queue. Certainly, and ladies and gentlemen, to ask a question, that is star one on your telephone keypad. Please note that if you're on a speakerphone, to pick up your handset or depress your mute function to allow that signal to reach our systems. Again, that is star one to ask a question. And we'll go first to Savi Saeed with Raymond James. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm just kind of curious after the kind of Black Sea news, you know, have you seen a change in booking behavior and, and also I know the you know, testing requirement is probably positive longer term for opening up international demand, but are you seeing you know, travelers perhaps shifting from more, to more de domestic summons and destinations from international? Uh, Savvy, we, uh, the vaccine uh, deployment still is very early and we haven't really seen, seen much in the, in the form of change behaviors. We hear a lot anecdotally, but you know, it's also one of the weakest uh, travel periods of the year in the uh, in the current month that we're in. Uh, we've not seen the booking curve uh, start to expand. We, we certainly hope to see that as we, we get through uh, the quarter and vaccines continue to become more prevalent. Makes sense. 
I'd be curious to uh, just uh, follow up on, on some of the kind of the changing dynamics here. I was wondering if you have any kind of preliminary thoughts on how maybe the American and JetBlue partnership might impact kind of the Northeast uh, p position. We're, we're not going to comment on uh, on our competitors or speculate. You know, we you, you know us well. You know we love competition, and uh, I think competition makes you better. All right. Appreciate it. Thank you. Next, we'll go to Jamie Baker of J.P. Morgan. Hey, good morning, everybody. First question for Glenn, uh, sort of a follow-up, I suppose, on Sabi's question. Uh, in normal times, what percentage of international revenue is made up of trips that last fewer than four or five days? You know, I'm asking because, you know, I would think a trip of that duration would be particularly jeopardized by the need to land and almost immediately take a COVID test so that you could come home. Well, you know, I, I think that's a, dependent on how far customers are traveling. Generally, the longer they travel, the longer the stay is. So uh, I think what we are seeing is a very good response from the closer in uh, Caribbean and Mexico resorts where hotels are now going to be offering that as part of the package. And so while there may be some choppiness as there has been through this whole environment uh, as we start adopting those testing procedures, we think in the pretty short order here that uh, customers will adapt. And to the extent that travel does shift from short haul international back to domestic, we'll be ready to move the airplanes back too. Uh, Jamie, I'd like to add to Glenn's comments. Uh, you know, we're, we're still working obviously with the CDC. We endorse and support the testing uh, requirements they've put in place, but a, a new feature is uh, the inclusion of rapid testing into the mix. So it doesn't necessarily mean it only has to be a PCR test. And uh, with, with the, uh, the, the growth of antigen tests and the quality of antigen testing that's out there and the supplies in that place, you literally could get these, some of these tests done within a 10 minute uh, interval uh, you know, shortly before you return. Excellent. Thank you for that, gentlemen. And a question uh, for Gary. How are you thinking about the optimal level of liquidity to carry in the future? Uh, you know, sort of a post-pandemic question. And, and if you haven't reached that conclusion yet, is that because it's just not a priority right now, or do you simply need to wait and you know see how the recovery plays out before reaching a, a decision? Jamie, I, mean, I think what I would say is, um, you know, it's obviously less than today. Uh, we we need some time. We have, I think, some work in front of us to think through where we ultimately want that to be. But I think the important point is, you know, we're we're getting started, uh, and I think you see some of that. Uh, during the quarter, we prepaid a um, our a term loan that was uh, matured in April for about uh, three billion dollars. Uh, we mentioned during the script that we do plan to make a pension contribution, which, as you know, we consider part of our financial obligations. Uh, so we are getting started. We don't have more specifics, but we are getting started. Um, and you know, we're, we're very focused on that $350 million number that, uh, that mm -hmm. I described uh, and using the liquidity uh, that we have where it makes sense to drive that down. And just a fine point on, on PSP, a uh, simple yes or no question, have the terms been achieved, and if so, are they the same as the first round? Thanks. Yeah, Jamie, it's Peter Carter. The terms are identical to PSP-1. Perfect. We've already signed the agreement with the government. Thank you, everybody. Thank Take you. care. Thanks, Jamie. Our next question will come from Hunter Key of Wolf Research. Good morning. Uh, Ted, about a year ago, we talked on this call about um, intentionally running lower load factors, and uh, it's happening but in a weird way, but you're getting paid for it, and your NPS scores are, as you mentioned, at an all-time high. So, you know, unblocking middle seats is obviously a, a tactical choice, but even when you unblock them, you don't have to sell them. So I guess the question is, longer term, how are you thinking about running less full airplanes as an opportunity to differentiate yourself for that premium traveler? Uh, yes, Hunter, it is an interesting year. Uh, I'll, I'll say that. Uh, we've not made a decision beyond the end of March relative to uh, our uh, when to uh, unblock the middle seats. Uh, but we have some time. Uh, let's continue to look at that. I think it's going to be very much uh, driven by customer demand, uh, customer input. 
uh, the confidence customers have in, in those seats, but you know, no question about it, we are generating a meaningful premium uh, due to that decision. Hunter, if I could have just a quick follow-up on that. Is there, I guess there are two ways, as we discussed last year, to do that. One is by creating more premium seats, um, and the other is by running lower load factors. As we go through this fleet transition, there are premium seats as a percent of our total seats <coughs> continue to rise, and I think that's our primary uh, way to satisfy the demand for premium customers is to continue to provide them with a higher level of quality. Got it. Yeah, thank you, Glenn. And then um, on the 18,000 early outs, uh, are, can you achieve 2019 capacity without backfilling any of those positions? Uh, could you speak louder? We missed your question. The start of your question, honey. Right, Sorry about that. Yeah, the, no, that's cool. The, the, the 18,000 early outs, uh, the, the question is, like, how much of, can you achieve 2019 capacity levels without backfilling the majority or the entirety of those positions? Uh, we can't achieve eight, uh, 2019 levels without close to 20% of our people. There's no question about it. There, but there's a, we don't need to backfill it entirely either. So, you know, there's a, there's a middle ground there. Okay. And then just one more quick one since we have 90 minutes, just to, to follow up on Jamie's follow-up. Have you, Peter, have you negotiated the, the new strike prices for the warrants attached to PSP too? Uh, we, we have, and it's $39 and some change. Thank you. And now we will go to Andrew Deodora of Bank of America. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, Glenn, uh, my first question for you, probably a little tough to answer, but just curious about how you're thinking about the kind of the trade-off between yield and load factor as you move through kind of the different phases of the recovery that you that you talk to. You know, as I think as travel restrictions ease, do you see the need to maybe stimulate more demand with price, or do you think there's enough pent-up demand in the network that you know load factor is a bigger driver? Just, just curious how you're thinking about that. I think we are uh, taking a yield bias as we go into the peak summer, um, hoping that demand exceeds supply. And if that doesn't materialize, we can make those adjustments later. But we have uh, anticipated that there will be a, a nice recovery in demand as we get towards the summer, and we've taken a conservative approach. I hope that answers your question. And I'll um, certainly have stream it a, a bit. Um, I, and then, Ed, I know Gary gave uh, some information about uh, CapEx this year, but I guess how are you thinking about that over the next few years, especially in light with your um, desire to, to de-lever here? And what do you need to see in order to feel more comfortable in uh, placing uh, new aircraft orders? Thank you. Well, Andrew, I think we're a little early yet in terms of thinking about the, the long-term CapEx picture. Uh, I was thinking, oh, we, we moved $5 billion of aircraft CapEx alone uh, with Air, Airbus out over, over the next several years. Um, you know, the degree to which we um, you know, want to take uh, positions, uh, new positions coming up, we'll, we'll continue to evaluate that based on demand. But right now, I, I feel pretty comfortable with where we sit. Thank you. And now we'll go to Brandon Ogrinsky of Barclays. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone, and thanks for taking the question. Um, Gary, can you talk about some of the structural things that you've taken out of the cost structure to reach that chasm target you know, by the end of the year? And I think you made a comment about incrementally like 40 to 50 percent of your fourth quarter chasm uh, would be variable. Is that, can I hear that right? Yeah, so, uh, Brandon, let me, let me uh, start with the first question. The, the structural costs, um, the two biggest ones in our business are really, uh, you know, headcount and fleet, as we mentioned. The fleet really uh, determines an awful lot of the, uh, the infrastructure that we need from a, from a cost standpoint. Uh, we expect to get leverage out of uh, all of our costs associated with assets. You know, we look about a third of our cost structure on a, a monthly uh, basis is fixed. So as we grow, we'll, we'll obviously get leverage there. And we have pockets of opportunity 
um, we, we have pockets of opportunity in, uh, in terms of better utilization of just the overall system. You know, when I, when I think about what we're doing here, and this gets to your second question, uh, there, there are kind of two big things that I talk about uh, or that we all talk about internally as we think about this effort that we're embarking on. The first uh, is baseline aggressively, and it's really have a laser focus on what's in the cost structure now uh, and what makes sense. You see that in the 50% reductions that we've been posting uh, now for several quarters. The second thing we say is leverage the build, uh, and that's really where the, the incremental uh, thought process comes. That's about being very thoughtful about better leveraging the system as, as we start to rebuild. Um, now, I think in terms of your second question, incremental cost, it's, uh, you know, it's pretty simple to what we're thinking about it. It's just change in cost divided by change in AFMs. And we wanted to give um, you know, some guidepost as to the leverage that we do expect going forward for the <clears throat> excuse me, 40 to 50 percent of December capacity comes in. Uh, I'll just note if you take a look at the second half of t uh, 2020, <clears throat> it was quite a bit better than that. And that was uh, why I emphasized that comment in the prepared remarks about how we scaled the system, uh, particularly in the fourth quarter. Well, thank you, sir. I think those were my two. Our next question will come from Roddy Schenker of Morgan Stanley. Uh, thanks. Morning, everyone. A couple of questions on business travel. Uh, you said that uh, small and medium-sized corporates are coming back first. Are you surprised by that? And, and is, is that good news or bad news for you know when the bigger guys come back when the world opens up again? Uh, Ravi, we're, we're not surprised by that. Uh, these are uh, small business owners who need to get out to their customers, who have to work hard every single day to, to keep their sales and their, their business moving. And we do see a, a meaningful uh, in, uh, continued improvement in, in small uh, business traffic. You know, some that we can measure, others that we can't see because uh, they're not under, under contracts with us. But we know that's been an important part of, uh, of overall business travel. Uh, but I do want to talk about the uh, overall corporate uh, travel results. As you probably know, we extensively survey our corporate customers, our large corporate customers, on a on a quarterly basis, in addition to just being with them uh, on a weekly basis, as to their thoughts on the return of travel. And uh, the most recent survey that we conducted, which just ended a couple of weeks ago, uh, indicated that 40% uh, of, of our big corporate customers expect they will be fully back to 2019 levels by 2022. Uh, and another 11% said that they expect to be fully back by 2023. So that's uh, a little over 50% of the, of the customers. And these are the people, everyone's speculating what's going to happen to business travel. These are the customers who make those decisions. 7% uh, uh, said we'll never be back to uh, 2019 levels. Only 7%, and 42% uh, said they, they weren't sure, uh, needed more time to figure it out. So with all the, the dialogue and speculation around the death of business travel, just looking at that survey, it's very interesting. Uh, if you take the 51% that said they'll be fully back by 23, the majority of which is in 22, uh, and then you consider the second uh, quadrant, the 50% who so they'll never return or they're not sure of the return. And even if you assume only 50% of their travel returns, that gets you 75% of the way back uh, no later than 23. And I think that's a, that's a very uh, pessimistic view on business travel. So what we've been talking about, corporate travel, uh, business travel returning, I, I felt optimistic when I saw those results. Uh, we know it's going to be different going forward. I, I've said many times it could be 10 to 20% lower over over a period as it's substituted and complemented. Uh, there will be different types of travelers, different reasons for people traveling. But uh, I think business travel has got a, a very, very uh, uh, strong opportunity to return over the next two years, and we're going to be well positioned to carry it. 
That is great color on the demand side of business travel. Thank you for that. If I can just follow up with a question on the supply side, uh, clearly you guys are leaders uh, from a corporate travel standpoint, but we have seen some of your uh, uh, LCC competitors uh, start to and maybe try and make some inroads as that traffic comes back. So maybe you can kind of can you give us more color on kind of how you maintain that leadership and kind of how you see the competitive environment looking like uh, for business travel when that does come back. I think that the delta difference has never been more pronounced than it is right now. And if you look at our share of corporate travel that is traveling, we have experienced the highest levels in our history. So demand for our products and services is incredibly high for people who want it. And I think that's where our challenge remains is to continue to provide industry-leading uh, products and services that our, our corporate travelers want and need. And that's been what we've been doing over the past several years and what we'll continue to do as we get to the end of this uh, pandemic. And I think that's going to be what differentiates us. And clearly there's always people who would like to take that travel away from you because it is some of the uh, highest yielding travel in the system. But I think that's our goal and our mission is to stay ahead of that and provide it through a pull. People want to fly Delta and uh, as opposed to a push, which is, hey, we can lower fares and try and nibble up the sides or at the bottom of this. Very good. Thank you. And now our next question will come from Catherine O'Brien of Goldman Sachs. Good morning, Ron. Thank you so much for the time. Um, so my first question is actually about your, your comment earlier about seeing a cash recovery before a revenue recovery, and, and just trying to square that with the 65% of your ATL as vouchers. You know, as, as maybe early prospective bookings are coming in for later in the year, are these majority new bookings? Um, or, or maybe there's a higher percentage of those vouchers that are, are corporate and you expect the early part of the recovery to be leisure. We just love some color on that comment. Thank you. Yeah, um, Katie, some, some of that came through a little garbled, but let, let me say this. I think the distinction is really uh, about timing. Um, you know, in the, in the early, in the, in the spring, what we expect uh, and mentioned it a few times, we think as confidence starts to build, uh, what you'll see is that people will start booking for uh, further out in the booking curve. And so uh, our, we will have a build in our air traffic liability that helps us cross cash break even uh, earlier in the spring. P&L break even uh, is, is something that will take a little bit more. That's when, uh, you know, our revenue is going to be covering uh, our expenses, and that is something that we expect uh, will uh, lag a little bit behind the build-in bookings, and will be there uh, by the summer, as we've mentioned. Maybe just a little bit on, on our redemptions for the e-credits is we are running in the low to mid-teens right now in terms of total revenues. Uh, with the e-credits coming back, and we expect that uh, to stay below 20 as we move through this next uh, next period here. And that, and that number has been pretty consistent throughout the entire year, so we have a pretty good sense for what that's going to look like. Okay, understood. And, and can you guys hear me a little bit better now? Yeah. Okay, great. Understood. And I know you guys have one of the furthest out um, periods through which people can redeem, so, so that, that makes sense. Um, you know, maybe one on the cost structure, you know, of course, this pandemic has created a lot of pain for the industry, so I, I don't want to glaze over that. But, you know, outside of speeding up your fleet simplification, have you found other opportunities to make the operation more efficient, perhaps maybe speeding up some of your automation plans on the customer-facing side? Um, we'd love to just hear about um, other opportunities that have been born out of this crisis. Thank you very much. Uh, we have, Katie, I'm, I'm not sure we're going to get into uh, some of the specifics. I will say that the, uh, the fleet simplification has been, um, you know, it's something actually that we think is in our run rate uh, today. You're seeing some of the benefit in the fourth quarter, um, but we, it, it is something that will have a much bigger impact uh, as we move to, uh, to rescale the network through uh, 2021. Um, you know, I, I, when, I, when, I, when I mentioned the concept of uh, leveraging the build, you know, it, and maybe one of the reasons why, you know, I'm, I'm uh, 
thinking through it, just as I'm thinking through it, is there are a lot of things that uh, you know we want to think about doing differently. You know, one of the unique opportunities of you always want to make something good out of what uh, has transpired, and it does give us an opportunity to start fresh. One of the reasons I think we are showing the kind of leverage as we rebuild is because we have a clean sheet of paper in, in some sense to start from. Yeah, and I, I'd like to add to Gary's comments. I, I think it's remarkable the work the team has done on the cost side to get out in the fourth quarter to the point where our, our all-in unit costs are 4.5% lower quarter over quarter despite uh, having uh, over 40% less capacity to work with. It speaks to the, uh, the ingenuity of, of the team, uh, rethinking as we, as we speak what the, what the uh, not just the current environment, but the future environment is. And these are not costs that we're deferring out into the future. We're, we're making real changes uh, real time here. And uh, it touches every part of our business. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's been one of the, since demand has been low, you know, we've been all over cost the entire year, and the team has done really, really good, good work here. Yes, definitely some impressive staff you were able to throw out earlier. Uh, well, thank you all for the time. Thank you. Our next question will come from Dwayne Zingsworth of Evercore ISI. Hey, thanks. Good morning. Um, you, you covered this in pieces, and I follow up to a couple of other analysts. But um, you know, one of the things that Delta has been talking about during this crisis, which, which makes a lot of sense, is you know getting to 2019 chasm on a capacity footprint that's smaller. So I, w I wonder if you'd um, kind of quantify how much smaller a footprint uh, can can Delta still deliver. 2019 chasm, and is the thinking or the logic and the focus really more on chasm recovery and margin recovery before necessarily capacity recovery? Uh, Dwayne, I'll take that. Listen, they're, they're all interrelated. Um, you need to put the, the revenue and the capacity out there in line of demand, not in line of your chasm uh, strategy. and, and uh, but they're they're certainly connected to the to the uh, the ability to drive costs down. Um, you know, one of the things that we have uh, been a leader for many many years, uh, really the last decade, is on our upgaging strategy uh, domestically particularly, and that will continue to be important as we as we move forward. And while we talk about simplifying the fleet, uh, we've taken some big steps in that direction. We're also going to be advancing. The, uh, the upgaging of the, of the domestic fleet at the same time. So that's a, that's a big contributor. We'll continue to be a contributor with, with both driving down cost as well as improving the customer experience in, uh, in revenue, including premium revenue opportunities. Uh, you know, we said in, I said in my remarks that we're, our goal is to get that uh, 2019 uh, unit cost by, uh, by the end of this year on roughly 75% of 2019 capacity levels, I think that's a pretty good marker. Um, you know, we hope our capacity level is higher, I'll be honest with you, that uh, the demand environment is, is driving that. But that's going to be driven by demand, not by cost. That, that's very helpful. And then maybe just broad brush strokes, you gave us the 75% by year end. Is that, is that how we should be thinking about, you know, your view of exit rate? And, and how are you thinking, again, it can change, but how are you thinking about the summer uh, as a percent of 2019. No, we're not. We're not using that as a guide for capacity levels. We're using that for our own internal calculus in terms of where we need to get our our cost structure down. Uh, it won't be 75 percent. It may be higher, maybe lower. I don't know. There's a long way to go. Uh, you know, between here and there, and we'll keep you posted as we go. Okay. And then just just last one, maybe maybe a question from a from a different era, but. Um, could you, could you walk us through uh, the comps on revenue uh, monthly? Because it, it, it seems like your guidance um, foots well. You know, January, February, uh, similar to kind of 4Q levels, but, but March, it seems like there's a wide range of outcomes on March, and, and obviously the comps, you know, fall off materially, you know, m middle of March. So I don't know if you have the data handy, but, you know, how much – Easier is is March and April relative to to kind of Jan Feb. 
Uh, Dwayne, we're, we're not going back to, to give him monthly, uh, monthly revenue guides. So I'm sorry, I'm going to have to pass. Fair enough. The comps do get easier. Thanks for taking the questions. The comps will get easier. April will be easier. And now we will go to Joseph Denardi of Stiefel. Thanks, Ed. Good morning. Um, Ed, you, you talked about uh, I guess the, the corporate travel environment. It, in a scenario where corporate traffic is impaired 15 to 20 percent, what does that mean for your all's earnings power, and, and why shouldn't we be concerned that, that I guess, that the fleet strategy is adding more premium seats into a guess, declining premium market? Uh, Joe, I, I wouldn't draw the conclusion that uh, corporate travel is impaired at all. In fact, I, I've not said that. I think we may see lower corporate travel, uh, but I also think it will be changed, uh, potentially a different mix. So I don't think we should be uh, worried or ringing alarm bells uh, relative to the future of corporate travel. All indications are this corporate travel is ready to start coming back, and it will come back pretty aggressively uh, beginning in the second half of this year. Uh, we are we're a smaller airline. Uh, we've got 200 fewer planes uh, today. Uh, we've already right-sized the business to be smaller, which will help uh, protect the, the, the premium revenue sources and the margins of the business. Uh, and that's why we're you know we spent a lot of time on this call talking about our cost performance. That's that's uh, that's going to be the key to make sure that we protect the margins in an environment where corporate travel you know will be down for the for the foreseeable future. Maybe it's permanently down by a little bit of lower amount, but I'm, I'm not ready to declare that quite yet. Could I, could I add something to that? Is that I think when you think about our premium products and services, you also ought to think that these are not only filled by corporate travelers. As a matter of fact, uh, only less than a third of the seats are actually filled by the corporate travelers, and two thirds are filled by non corporates. And I think it's our ability to provide the right products and services for, for non corporates as well with the right sell-up opportunities so that we can match their preferences to our products and services. And I think that's really been one of the great hallmarks of the transformation is to say, this is really available to everybody at reasonable prices. And that's been our one of our key successes, I think. Got it. That makes sense. Um, Ed, it, it's my understanding that owners of your SkyMail debt are getting access to quarterly updated financial disclosures for SkyMile, similar to those you provided when you marketed the transaction. It's my understanding that equity investors are not. So, so my question for you is, how is that fair? How do you expect your equity investors to make a fully informed decision on your stock if they're not being provided with updated disclosures for, for what you guys have proven is your most valuable asset? Thank you. Uh, Joe, I'll let Gary take that because he's closer to the financial disclosures. But I will say, while the, the uh, law department is a very important asset, our most important asset are our people. Gary? Yeah, Joe, we, so, um, we are providing some disclosures to, um, you know, to those debt holders, as you described. Um, you know, look, I, I think we agree with, uh, you know, some of the sentiment that you have expressed over time. We, we see the value there. I think Glenn did a good job of, uh, articulating how well um, it is holding up. We've been on a path to provide more information there. I think you'll have to uh, be a little forgiving. We, we've, we've had a lot uh, on our mind, and uh, you know, I think you can expect us to, uh, to continue down that path for the reason, for the very same reason that I think you've been asking, for, uh, asking about it, uh, because we do see the value there. Thank you. And now we will go to Greg Conrad of Jeffries. Uh, good morning, and thank you. Uh, just to follow up on, on some of the past questions, I mean, I guess in terms of the competitive environment, your yields have held up relatively well, you know, only down 2 or 3% on a relatively short booking curve with reduced corporate travel. I mean, how do you think about that potential trajectory for yields as you uh, the booking curve normalizes and some of the corporate travel returns? I mean, is there opportunity to kind of be above where you were in 2019? I think there's always opportunity to be above where we were in 2019. That's clearly our goal in the, you know, any, if it could be a short-term goal, it would be, but I think it's more medium to a long-term goal. But our, I think we are going to come out with a higher preference 
uh, than we've ever had, and that higher preference it will drive a higher demand set, which should enable us to uh, to work on yields as we come out at the back end of this. So I, I think it goes back to how did people react to the pandemic and how did Delta's brand come through this? And I think from all the research we've done and from all the uh, data that we see that our brand has never been stronger and demand for our products and services has never been stronger on a relative basis. And we're planning on capitalizing on that on the back end of this. Thank you. And then just one quick follow-up, just a cleanup question. I mean, how should we think about uh, refinery sales for the year, any change versus what you saw in Q4? Uh, what are, you, are you referring to the uh, third-party sales? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, about? sorry, third, third party. Yeah, it's um, the, the phenomenon that you're seeing in the third-party sales is, um, you know, anything we produce and do not exchange for jet fuel, we sell to third parties. Uh, obviously, with our jet consumption being way down, we've had a lot more uh, of those sales to third parties. Uh, so I, that is going to uh, likely trend with, you know, how we rebuild our network and, and how much jet fuel we're consuming. I do think it's important to point out uh, that those sales uh, have no margin. Uh, um, if, if you look in some of the uh, reconciliations in the back of the release, uh, you'll see that uh, those are offset dollar, by, dollar for dollar, rather, on the uh, cost side. So. They're all wrapped into the economics of the refinery, but you should expect those to uh, start trending down as our consumption picks back up and we're exchanging more for our own uh, use. Thank you. And next we will go to Mike Lindenberg of Deutsche Bank. Hey, good morning, everyone. Hey, um, Hey, um, Ed, I'd just like to go back on the, you know, the mandatory COVID tests for international arrivals. Are you aware of any potential carve-outs, you know, like for those 24, 48-hour round trips? Um, and if you were to have a vaccine to be vaccinated, would you be precluded from actually having to provide that test on entry? Hey, Mike, it's Ed. Um, you know, we're still working through the, the guidance from the CDC. Uh, okay. It's evolving. Uh, we we have mentioned. Uh, I, I personally have had a number of conversations with Dr. Redfield on this. Uh, we've we've mentioned the the needs to consider some waivers in uh, unusual circumstances where, for example, COVID uh, testing resources are not available, or mm -hmm. if there are some, some relatively short term, as you mentioned, uh, uh, travel. So. We're working through the uh, the implementation details. I think it's absolutely the right thing to do for the long term for our industry, but it's going to it's going to create some uh, some short term uh, hiccups. Okay, agreed. And then um, just a question to um, Glenn and and possibly Peter Carter. I I know that you had sort of deferred on JetBlue American. Um, what I'm more interested in is it looks like as part of that transaction. It does look like that there's going to be a slot device divestiture, and that would obviously be um, at airports that are near and dear to Delta. Are those slots that, um, from what you know, are, the, are those slots that only new entrants can bid on, or are those slots that all carriers can bid on? And if that's the case, is that something that would interest Delta? Thank you. Thank you. So uh, the DOT has not made it clear what the rules are with respect to those slots, but I, I think it's suffice it to say that we are deserving uh, in DCA without question because of our market position. Mm -hmm. Very good. Peter. And now we will go to David Vernon of Bernstein. Hey, good morning. Um, so, uh, Edward Gary, could you talk to um, how as we move through these next three phases, um, how and when discretionary costs may come back into the system? I'm wondering if um, there's going to be a need to, to, to prime the pump a little bit on the cost side uh, to prepare for what should be a pretty pretty um, uh, steep recovery as vaccinations roll out. Uh, well, there, there will be uh, some, David. We expect, you know, for example, um, to uh, have reactivation expenses around uh, maintenance and aircraft. Uh, 
you know, through through the remainder of the year. So we expect uh, that pace to continue. I'm, I'm not sure I quite heard the the non was it discretionary or non discretionary expenses well, so, that you were asking. So, I, I imagine you guys have curtailed a lot of, of, of discretionary expense, whether it's marketing or IT development or systems yeah. work or training programs, what have you. I'm just wondering if there's if there's going to be a need to to step up that spend yeah. ahead of recovery here in the uh, in the intervening months. Well, I, I'd prefer to think of it not uh, to pick it up before recovery, but I, you know we will have a need to um, uh, to revisit uh, some of the things that we've done. Uh, you know, if you if you uh, take a look, David, at uh, what we're pointing to in terms of incremental costs that we lever as we leverage the network, uh, it does look different than what we saw in the second half of 2020. And one of the reasons is, you know, we we do expect to have pressure in pockets. We have to be really mindful and uh, balance some of those needs with the realities of the business because we are determined here uh, to turn the uh, to turn the profit equation around uh, and to be printing these releases with black ink uh, this year. Hey, David, this is Ed. Let me, let, me, let me expound on that just a bit. Uh, we, we are, uh, whether it's maintenance expenses, we've got our, our staffing levels uh, back to where we need to be starting the first of this year. Uh, we've restored the pay in terms of some of the, 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 uh, the, the pay cuts, the voluntary pay cuts that that our, our employees took last year. So there's a meaningful step up already in the numbers we've given you for the cash burn in the first quarter to get ready for the, the recovery. So I'm very comfortable with where we sit. Uh, in fact, if we wanted to continue to run the same cost structure and forego, uh, you know, some of those expenses, you'd see our cash burn coming down you know, you have relatively meaningful levels in, in the, the first quarter as well, but we've, we've maintained the same level of cash burn uh, to get ready for the uh, for the spring. That, that's helpful. Um, and then maybe just as a, as a follow-up, um, you know, you noted in the release the amount of CapEx that's come out of the budget over the next couple of years. I'm wondering if there's been a discussion at the board level about goal posts or guide posts for profitability before we kind of go back to um, renewing the fleet in earnest. Uh, David, again, I think that question is a little premature. Uh, yes, we, we talked about that topic of the board. We obviously haven't made any determinations quite yet. Um, the goal we have at the board is, is very much what we said to you, is that we get to our goal is to get to a cash uh, break-even position for the second quarter and a return to profitability uh, starting in the third quarter. All right, thank you. you know, the, the pace of that, of that recovery over the next couple of years, obviously, we still have some work to do yet. Okay. Thanks. Kathy, we're going to have time for one more question from the analyst, if you can queue that up. Certainly, and that question will come from Joe Seattle of Credit Suite. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the time. Um, Ed, Glenn, just a quick clarification question regarding your annual corporate travel survey. When 40% of respondents say fully recovered by 2022, are they referring to their businesses being fully recovered by 2022 or their corporate travel budget being fully recovered by them? Or, or do they see it as one and the same? Their corporate travel being back by that. Got it. Okay. Um, understood. It's helpful. And um, my second question, just it's clear that you're not seeing any elongation of the booking curve yet at this stage, but but what about clicks or looks, you know, stopping short of actual bookings, but is there any data like that that you're tracking, analytics on the website, something like that, that provides a basis for your recovery outlook beyond Q1 and, and sort of saying that you have a good shot at P&L break even in Q3? Or are you just, you know, hopeful that that's going to be the case? Is there Are there any analytics that you can share with us that, that maybe give you a better um, indication? Thank you for the time. Absolutely, corporate uh, looks are are actually doing quite well. We're 40% uh, up over quarter over quarter where we were last quarter in terms of looks, and look to book is very low. So people are looking, they're aspiring to travel, and they're just not ready to commit yet. And I think that's what really gives us that uh, sense that there will be a point in which people feel comfortable again to travel, and that uh, look will turn into a click, turn into a booking. And so uh, we are monitoring that very, very carefully, and uh, we're looking forward to the opportunity to serve these customers as they come back. Thanks for that, caller. 
That's going to wrap up the analyst portion of this call. I will turn it over to Tim Mays, our Chief Marketing and Communications Officer. Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I want to thank all the members of the media who have gathered on the, the call today. Your interest in, in Delta is not only appreciated, it's never been greater, and we're very pleased today to uh, provide you with an expanded period of time uh, to, to make sure that we address your questions. I'd also like to thank Ed and, and Glenn and the members of the Delta Leadership Committee, all of whom are on this call for uh, their involvement as we turn the page on 2020 and, and optimistically look at 2021. So, Kathy, if, if you could please review the, the instructions and mention to everyone how they uh, go about uh, asking a question. Certainly. And again, ladies and gentlemen, that is star one on your telephone keypad if you'd like to ask a question. Again, as a reminder, if you're on a speakerphone, please pick up the handset or depress your mute function to allow that signal to reach our systems. Again, that is star one to ask the question, and we'll pause to allow everyone the opportunity to signal. And we'll go first to Allison Sider of the Wall Street Journal. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about some of the operational issues we saw around the holidays, you know, Thanksgiving and Christmas, and, you know, what, looking back, you think were kind of the root causes of, of that, and, you know, what, if any, changes you've made to prevent the same sort of thing from happening again? Sure, Allie. We uh, uh, certainly had a much better Christmas holiday than the, uh, the Thanksgiving break. Uh, there were a number of factors going on. In the, uh, in the staffing levels of the company with a lot of the changes that we, we had implemented. And you couple that with, with COVID and some of the exposures which everyone seeing, the, uh, the no-fly uh, capability of, of some of our staffing, which came in. Uh, we learned from that for Thanksgiving. Uh, we made some, uh, some pretty uh, aggressive changes in December in terms of getting the schedule fine-tuned to, uh, to, to anticipate that. And uh, we were in really, really good shape, and then we got hit with a, a massive storm in Minneapolis on the uh, 23rd of December, which, which cost us probably uh, a couple of hundred cancels, incremental cancels over that, uh, that next couple of day time frame, which, which uh, was concerning but un unavoidable, unfortunately. The, the most important thing in all of that is one that the Delta people, and I know there were some uh, bloggers out there wondering whether the, the, the Delta pilots weren't uh, doing everything again. The Delta pilots were amazing through the both holiday periods and showing up and, and, and getting getting the flights going and giving up their holidays and their uh, their time away uh, uh, with the families to help the company out. So it had nothing to do with pilot staffing at all. Uh, it, the uh, the other thing was the uh, number of customers who may have been canceled, while it's, it's higher than we've been expecting, the vast majority of the people got to their destination within hours of their, their original schedule time. So the team did a very, very good job, and, uh, and that issue was pretty much uh, over with by uh, the 26th, 27th. And, and that really manifested itself in the record net promoter score we had in the December time period. So uh, as Ed mentioned, despite the fact that we had to cancel some flights, our average lateness was not very late versus the original itinerary, and our customers uh, over the holiday period were quite satisfied posting record high net promoter scores. And just to follow up, uh, is there anything you can share about what you're seeing in terms of, you know, crew member infections at this point? You know, I know the, the pilots have said they saw some big increases in COVID infections. Um, you know, in a late fall, and just wondering if you're still seeing that or if that's sort of been brought under control. Well, you know, you know we're, we're a microcosm of the, of the country, and as the, the pandemic has accelerated over the course of the last few months, you know, it's accelerated across airline employees as well. Um, but, you know, our team's doing a real job. They're not seeing it spread within the company uh, when they're at work. It's, it's unfortunate it's in community. Uh, is where the uh, where, where people are getting sick. So uh, I'd say every every work category of of the company is experiencing an increase in exposures as we've all seen over the last couple of months. Yeah, thank you. And now we will go to Tracy Lusinski of Reuters. Hi. Good morning. I'm wondering if you think we'll see 
COVID-19 testing being required for domestic flights? Uh, Tracy, I don't think so. Okay. And uh, just to follow up with a separate question, uh, should we expect to see a deal with Boeing this year for a 737 MAX order? Uh, we, we're not going to speculate on that. Okay, thank you. Sorry. And now we'll go to Claire Wushi of Financial Times. Hi. Um, I know Delta has been uh, growing its own list of people who are not able to fly in the airline, but I was wondering if the company had any visibility into whether more names are being added to the federal no-fly list based on last week's capital attacks. Claire, you, 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 the, the last part was a little garbled. Is your question, did, are we adding uh, increased numbers to our no-fly list based on federal information? I was asking whether the, I was asking whether Delta knows if names are being added to the federal no-fly list based on the capital attacks. Uh, we certainly know that the TSA is looking very carefully at the uh, at, at those that were uh, uh, in the Capitol uh, building, the rioters, and um, we are we are working closely with them. And I do anticipate if uh, the TSA um, you know, uh, is able to identify individuals, you'll have people added to the no fly list. No questions about it. Thank you. And next we have Leslie Joseph of CNBC. Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, you mentioned that there was a lot of pent-up demand and also the hoarding of points um, from the frequent flyer program. What happens if a lot of people try to redeem at once? Is that something that you're expecting based on search data and other things? And then also you mentioned a recovery second half of the year. Where are you seeing demand? Are those sort of outdoor uh, social distancing destinations uh, showing more strength than, than others? Like where is the demand coming from? Thanks. Well, clearly leisure destinations are at the forefront of the recovery right now, and uh, I think it doesn't matter whether or not it's a beach or a mountain, that's where people are headed uh, at this point in the recovery. Um, and then your second question was? Uh, about the point. Oh. point. So if people yeah. are hoarding, yeah. What happens if everyone, yeah. and are you foreseeing that they, they will, are trying to redeem? Uh, we are. We are we are happy and, and really have the, are indifferent whether or not people who are booking are using points or whether or not they're using uh, actual dollars or whether they're using e-credits. What we are anticipating is a, that all of those will increase, and we have plenty of capacity to, uh, to meet that demand as we head to the uh, second half of uh, 21. So we're hoping that all of the above happens. You know, the, okay. the, uh, I'm, I'm talking to American Express, uh, good partners there. It's clear that people place great value on their on their loyalty points with Delta, and like to see the values grow over time. And so, while they they've been in the pandemic, um, we've 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 seen redemptions down uh, for points because you know flying levels are down, but they haven't stopped uh, you know the spending on the card our co-brand card is as good as not uh, better than almost any other product card Amex has. So it's uh, has great appeal, and we expect it's not going to be a not to be a run on the bank type situation that you're referring to. Okay, you could just adjust the awards, the availability, and things like that too, right? Absolutely. If there is a absolutely, money. we're looking forward to that day. Thank you. And now we will go to David Kion of the Associated Press. Hi, real quick question. Uh, unless I missed it, I, I have not heard a, an update in a while on the number of people you have banned for not wearing face masks. Is there a current figure on that and uh, any changes in, in cabin policies? Uh, I think that number is north of 800 at this point, David. Okay. okay. Very good. Uh, and then how many of those are since last week, do you know? Uh, a number, not a huge number, but a number. Okay. And 
now our question will come from Kelly Yamauchi of the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. Hi there. Um, I wanted to ask about uh, profit sharing. Uh, with no profit sharing, you know, next month from 2020 results, I was wondering um, uh, what impact you think that may have on employees and satisfaction, and also wondering if there's a if you think there's a possibility of profit sharing a year from now. Well, uh, I think everyone is aware why there's not profit sharing in uh, in this year, and uh, I can tell you employee satisfaction is at a very a very high level. I, I mentioned during this script, Kelly, that uh, we just uh, were awarded the, the seventh best employer by Glassdoor. Glassdoor is an entirely uh, employee-driven uh, uh, acknowledgement. The company doesn't have any any input or any insight into that. That's it's purely by employees talking about their employers. So if that gives you a sense for the sentiment, the sentiment is very strong. Uh, the volunteerism with the you know, tens of thousands of people that have taken unpaid leaves of absence over the year indicates that. Uh, we've been mindful of the, of the fact that uh, there won't be a profit sharing payout and we're providing added uh, services and assistance around financial health and financial well-being and in uh, credit counseling and, and other services to employees that may need it. We're going to be ramping. We have been ramping up and talking about it. We're going to continue to talk about it uh, on, a, on an ongoing basis going forward with other people providing that support. And uh, relative to the, you know, next year's profit sharing, I certainly hope we'll be, uh, we'll be paying it. It's, it's uh, hard to speculate it now. It's just only a couple weeks into the year. But uh, you know, I'm hopeful that we'll be paying it. Great. Um, I also um, heard mentioned during the call so far about uh, the value of uh, connecting uh, economics, but also the importance of point-to-point and focus cities. I was wondering um, if you expect how you expect the Atlanta Hub's role to be different going forward in terms of size or the role in your network. Well, clearly the size of Atlanta is relative to the size of demand in the United States as the world's largest hub. Uh, it is a microcosm of uh, global airline demand, so we expect it to recover as, uh, as, a, as the airline uh, continues to recover. The two things that I would say is that we're going to continue to work on average gauge, which I think is a, something that's really important and that we'll be bringing more details about, but bigger airplanes with better products and services. And so I think you'll see, you know, the departures get back to 2019 levels at some point in the future. But before that, you'll probably see the employments start to rise dramatically and, and using really the gauge lever as much as the uh, departure level. This is, as you know, our most uh, valuable asset here in Atlanta, and we're very proud to, to uh, be a part of the Atlanta community. And, and uh, it has led us in the rebuild of our network so far. Great. Thank you so much. Our next question will come from Ted Reed of Forbes. Thank you for taking the questions. I have two questions for Glenn. First one, Glenn, when you said earlier Delta is ready when you are talking about when you come back, were you talking about in terms of capacity or something else? I think that when customers are are wanting to fly on Delta, we'll be ready for them. And uh, I know you're – I know you for a long time, and I know you remember that slogan, so I was harkening back to uh, a little bit of history there with Delta. So you're just saying you'll be ready, though. You'll have the capacity suited to what you anticipate customers will want. Correct. All right. Secondly, we've been talking a lot about uh, middle seats being empty and being, you said, a powerful tool. How are you measuring what the value – how can you tell that these are so valuable to to your customers? Our revenue premiums have never been higher, uh, and so customers are valuing the Delta difference, and uh, I think that's how we're looking at that, is when you look at our revenue production versus our competitive set, despite having the least amount of sellable capacity, our revenues have kept pace. So I think you know, we're seeing a, a, not only the highest share of corporate demand we've ever had, although albeit on the press levels, but a real differentiator when customers are shopping to want to fly Delta versus some of our competitors. And you think that's due to middle seats being empty longer than others? I think I think it's the entire Delta difference. Clearly, that's a piece of it. Um, but you know, whether or not it's the Delta Care standard, whether or not it's the Delta people, which are really always the, at the heart of it. But uh, this is one component of ensuring that Delta is seen as 
the brand you want to associate with. All right. Thank you. I appreciate it. And now we'll go to Don Gilbertson of USA Today. Hi, good morning. Uh, I also have uh, questions on your middle seat policy. Uh, Ed and Glenn, I know you both said you no know, decision has been made yet, but Glenn, your comment about, you know, in the second phase, the middle seat will be a very powerful tool. Sounds to me at least like you're certainly leaning towards unblocking them. Uh, a, is that a fair assumption? B, can you talk to us about the timing of this decision? When, when will you decide whether they are blocked beyond March 30th? Thank you. Uh, go on, just on, this is Ed. No, I would not say that's a fair assumption. I, what we, we said is that when the demand uh, returns, which is that next inflection point, uh, that will inform our decision around uh, what to do with the middle seat. So we, we've not made any any decisions uh, to uh, to unblock them post uh, post March 30th. But can you give us a sense of I mean, when will you make that decision? Because pretty soon, I know the booking curve is, you know, is still short, but you're kind of optimistic about summer. So will you make that decision in the next month, the next few weeks, a couple months? Can, can you give us any sense of that, please? Well, uh, we, we continue to monitor it on a regular basis. Uh, it's not imminent. Uh, we have we have some, uh, some bit of time. But it's going to be informed by customer sentiment, uh, demand. Uh, you know, we, we have, in addition to the middle seats, we have a lot of other seats still empty on our, on our plane. And uh, confidence in travel relative to COVID and uh, vaccine deployment. So, you know, it's, it's, it's not a, a, clear, uh, a clear line, and there's a, there's a lot that has to go into that. We know that it's been a, uh, an important, uh, not the only, but one of the important reasons why Delta has been able to earn, continue to earn an even higher revenue premium during this past year than we historically had. And so we want to be very, very careful as to how we make that decision. Thank you very much. And now we will go to Kiss Edward Russell. Hi, yes. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the changes in the competitive environment, uh, American JetBlue Alliance, the Northeast, and then how that, uh, how, how you intend to respond to that? You know, I, I think we're very confident in our products and services, and uh, we compete well against both those carriers individually, and I'm sure we'll compete uh, very well against them together. So we have, uh, we have a lot of confidence in our products and services in the Northeast. Okay. And then there's also been some expansion of some of your focus cities, Raleigh, Durham, Austin. Um, does Delta plan to, to return there and compete there as well? Focus cities will be an important part of our uh, of our portfolio moving forward, and, and we've uh, continued to work on making sure that we have the right capacity in those cities as demand returns. And so we're looking forward to demand continuing to return in, in all of our focus cities. Thank you. And now we will go to Robert Silk of Travel Weekly. Oh, thanks for taking my call. A um, couple of questions. Do you see uh, CDC given any indi indication? I know that A4A had called for test, wanted testing. In airline, you all wanted testing to be put in place, but but in exchange, a rollback of travel bans. Any indication that that could be next coming? I, I, your, your, your question, I'm sorry, was, was a bit garbled. Could you repeat that? We're having a hard time with some of our communications this morning. Um, can you hear me a little better now? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, any indication or sense from, from the federal government or CDC that with this blanket testing requirement that there could be a rollback of, of um, travel bans which is something that the, air, the airlines have called for. Uh, and, and, and I'll also follow the other, another question is any sense that vaccines ultimately could be included in the mix if you're vaccinated, uh, it relieves testing requirements or it could be an either or. We're still working with the CDC on the specific uh, testing strategy and, and deployment. Uh, uh, this is something that we, you know, Delta endorse. I know our industry uh, similarly endorses. 
we would like to see the uh, travel uh, restrictions lifted once the testing protocols are in place, and that will be a decision by the new administration, um, is my understanding, when they, uh, when they take office. And, uh, but I think by having the testing protocols in place, it then gives confidence to the regulatory authorities to start to lift the bans, which is why we endorse the, the, testing, uh, the testing strategy. Your question relative to vaccines, uh, yes, obviously once uh, vaccines are at scale, uh, we would hope that vac vaccination evidence would, would uh, uh, rec uh, supplant the, the need to show a, a test result. Uh, but, of course, we're still working with the authorities on that. Okay, thanks. Okay. Happy, we have time for uh, one final question for the group, please. Certainly, and that will come from David Slotnick of Business Insider. Hey, everyone. How are you? Thanks for the question. Um, I was just wondering about the phases, the three phases that Glenn outlined earlier. Um, you know, with that timing in mind and with the responses that you've gotten from your corporate travelers, is Delta still expecting, um, you know, a recovery to 2019 revenue and travel levels in line with the rest of the industry with the, um, I think it was 2023 or 2024 that IATA and A3A was uh, previously forecasting, or has that moved up pretty at all? Again, I'm, I'm sorry. It was hard to, to hear the question. Let me take a shot at it. Uh, the, the information we shared on the call about uh, corporate travel is, is the sentiment we're getting from our own uh, customers. As you, as you are aware, we are the largest carrier of corporate travel uh, amongst, the, uh, amongst the U.S. carriers, so I think we have the, probably some of the best insights uh, as compared to IATA or any other group that, you know, I, I don't know how they, they determine what 2023 or 2024 looks like. I wouldn't place too much confidence in that. But what our, what our corporate travelers, uh, corporate travel managers are telling us is that 50% uh, expected to be fully back by 2023. Uh, the other 50% uh, is largely uncertain, but uh, we, we expect a meaningful amount of, of, of that travel to return as well. Thanks. So does Delta have a forecast for when we'll return to 2019 travel levels? The numbers we're comparing are 20 to 2019 travel volumes, yes. Okay, thanks. Thank you, David. With that, we'll uh, turn it over to Ed to uh, make some final comments again. Thank you, everybody, for your time this morning. Well, thanks, Tim. Um, just in, in closing, I think you can all appreciate that 2020 was a, a difficult year, but we're on a uh, recovery path. Uh, we see the, the start of it uh, uh, beginning to crystallize here, particularly with the vaccine development. Um, and as you've heard earlier from Glenn and Gary, I'm confident that we've got the foundation in place to return Delta to revenue growth, profitability, and free cash flow generation. Uh, we're committed to keeping our culture intact and our employees engaged. Uh, we'll continue to listen to our customers and put them first in order to further enhance their experience on Delta increase their loyalty and drive affinity towards our brand. Uh, we're very focused on innovation, uh, which is allowing us not only to enhance the customer experience and drive efficiency, but also to tackle the big challenges that still lie ahead for us. Uh, we'll remain very focused on cost performance. We talked a lot about that during the call to ensure that the leisure-led uh, demand environment that, that emerges will be able to respond to it. And finally, we're committed to reducing debt, uh, strengthening our balance sheet and creating long-term shareholder value, uh, and allowing our owners to participate in future upside without dilution. We have the very best employees in the industry, and we're ready to see the strategy through, which gives me optimism, confidence in our ability to thrive and emerge as the industry leader. So thanks again for joining us today, and we look forward to speaking with you soon. And that concludes today's conference. We thank you for your participation today.